Are you ready for the next realm that God is about to unload on the church and on the planet? Are you ready? Are you picking up the signs? Peter had experienced signs, wonders and miracles. And yet one day, one night, Jesus came walking on the water and he said to himself, I've never seen that before. I've never been in that realm before. And if that's you, Lord, bid me to come. A lot of people on the boat watching, not sure whether it was God, but Peter had the, the ability to see the next move of God. And the challenge for the church is that many of us have, and I'm not saying you, but I'm just saying the church in general, we've become acclimatized to a, a Christian diet, a Christian message. And as soon as God wants to shake it, change it, we get all funny and weird. And, and, and the question is today, are you ready for what God is wanting to do? Or do you want a three-point sermon on... That's the question that we all have to ask ourselves. And in Philippians 4.19, I was reading that a few weeks ago, and it's a scripture verse that, you know, if you've been in church for a while, it's one that you memorize, whether you're like me and you're brought up in Sunday school, which shows you how old I am. And we had uh, felt boards instead of computers. But one of the scriptures we learnt was Philippians 4.19. And it says that my God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I didn't understand it, but I could memorize it. And a lot of Christians know that scripture. They could recite that to you. But what does it mean? Is it an invitation into a realm of glory that God is asking the church to come into so he can transform society? The Christian mindset is that we're praying for more of his power, his glory, across all of society, a sweeping move of God, and we'd all love to see that, wouldn't we? Okay, maybe you've not read about what happens when there's a sweeping move of God. The blind eyes open, the sick are healed, the dead are raised, encounters. In fact, it was just what this week or last week that we celebrated the 50th anniversary in Indonesia, the book Like a Mighty Rushing Wind where young children were so uh, captivated by the presence of God that supernatural miracles were happening. They were walking across rivers and doing um, the most amazing things. If you've never read the book, get that book, Like a Mighty Rushy Wind. Jeff Jansen, it was here two weeks ago, was preaching with Mel Tari, who was the figurehead of that great revival. So amazing things happen when the presence of God comes in a sovereign way over a nation, a city. But the problem is that, that it doesn't change society. And that's what I'm saying. Are we ready for a new move of what God wants to do? Are we ready to understand that it's his glory that transforms a society? See, when there's a sweeping move of God, he can come in, people get saved, whole cities uh, come under the weight of God's presence. But God's got something greater in mind this time. See, the problem is, is if you have these, this move of God and, and there's a sweeping of the presence of God, what the enemy is looking for, according to Matthew 12, 43, is he comes back after the sweeping move of God has dissipated or whatever it is that happens. And he says, is the house... Put in order, is it swept, is it clean? Is there any activity in the house? So he comes to each of these mountains, and you see I've got the cross under the mountain called the church. But he comes to the business mountain, the government mountain, family, education, so forth, and he sees whether the house is swept and clean and put in order, whether there's any activity. And if the glory of God hasn't penetrated these mountains... And if God hasn't raised up people with wisdom like Daniel and Mordecai that know how to govern nations and cities under the glory and presence of God, the enemy comes back and the Bible says he comes back seven times stronger. And he re-inhabits the mountains and takes again authority. And my understanding in this next move, the signs that God is leaving 
is that he wants to make sure that as his glory is poured out on you and me, that we understand that it's for this purpose. Isaiah chapter 2 says, it will come in the last days, that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of all mountains. One of the signs of the last days is that God's going to establish people like you and give you the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Mordecai, I've been reading Esther over and over this week, was a doorkeeper in the king's house. No education, really. Nothing spectacular about him. But he connected in with the heart of God under the anointing of God and he went from a doorkeeper to second in charge over 127 provinces in a day. And some of you have been thinking far too small about your life. And the glory of God has come to transform societies. And you've been thinking, what could God do through me? And the answer is everything. So Father, we thank you today for the power of your spirit. I thank you that your glory is here. Your presence is here. Lord, you said that Christ in us, the hope of glory, that your glory is resident in us. We just want to understand how to access that, tap into it, release it, flow with your glory and your anointing. For you promised that the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea and that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will be upon all the earth. Every person, we, we will, all your church, we will connect with how to access Everything that we need in your glory realm, and that realm is in us. The kingdom of God is in us. We thank you, Lord. We acknowledge every good thing that is in us in Christ Jesus. This day, in Jesus' name, amen. That scripture I just quoted then was Philemon verse 6, isn't it? That we need to acknowledge every good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus. There's a whole lot of good stuff inside you. Numbers 14, 21. To show how important the glory of God is, to, God made a vow and he said, As truly as I live, the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now that's not some mamby-pamby, something that's not tangible, not relevant, it's only for the mystics. The glory of the Lord is the key to transforming lives and nations. We read before, my God will supply all my needs according to the riches, the wealth, the abundance of God that is hidden in the glory realm. So as we wait upon the Lord, his glory begins to flow in us. As we learn how to access the glory realm by faith, we begin to access the treasures of the wisdom and the knowledge of Christ. The most productive thing that you could do in your day is to wait on the Lord. And as you wait on the Lord, his glory begins to flow in you and through you. And you begin to receive downloads of treasures of wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Isaiah 45, 40 verse 5 says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the earth will see it. It's not something that's not tangible. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the earth will see it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear me? It's going to be revealed through you. And the world will see, they will see something tangible yeah. Yeah. of the glory. And they will say, that can't be you. It must be yeah. God. It's the glory of the Lord. So living in the glory is the central theme in God's end time plan and purpose. Isaiah 43 verse 7, I'm going to give you a few scriptures. It says that we are made for his glory. And some people may interpret that. We are made to bring God glory. And that's true. But that's not what Isaiah is saying. He's saying, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. He created you to display his glory. You are created for his glory. Not just to bring him glory, but you are created to be a container, a vessel of his glory. You are filled right now, if you are a believer, with the glory of the Lord. Yeah. It's in you. Yeah. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You may look at your body today. You may look at your abilities, your education, and you might be thinking there's not too much to offer here. But the Bible says that we have this treasure, the glory of the Lord, hidden in this earthen vessel. Daniel 12, 4 says at the end time... Many will run to and fro, and the knowledge and knowledge shall increase. This is the revelation knowledge 
of the glory of the Lord. There is going to be an acceleration in this day of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. I tell you this, here is a sign from God. There is going to be an exponential increase in how to function in the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Sorry, function in the glory of the Lord. It's going to be exponential. This is what's going to happen. This is no longer time for Christianity 101 for people who've been born again for 10 years. God is saying in the last days, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to increase. It's going to be over all the earth and you're going to function in it. The glory manifested, the glory promised, the glory manifested. The Greek word for glory is doxa, which means brilliant, splendor. Glittering appearance, flamboyance, magnificence. The Hebrew word for glory is kabod, which means honor, abundance, and dignity. Heavy, majesty, weighty, or rich. There are two words where the glory, sorry, two areas where the word glory is used in the Bible in reference, firstly, to the attributes of God. The glory is the exact representation or of his being proceeding from him. It's the essence of all that God is. That's the glory. It's the exact, exact representation. It's, it's who God is. It flows from him. It's infinite. It's boundless. But also, the glory is, uh, can be described as the tangible, visible manifestation of his presence. It's tangible. It's visible. It's... It's the fullness of God from the realm of the spirit coming into the realm of the physical. So number one, it's the glory describes the, the essence of who God is, but it's also describing when, when there's a transfer from the supernatural realm into the natural realm, there is a physical, tangible, the glory cloud. They, they follow the cloud and the fire. It's tangible. When the glory of God is manifest, you can see it, taste it, touch it, smell it. There is benefits for everyone around us. Out of the glory comes amazing manifestations. You know, I like to think about the anointing of God being like rains that come from a cloud, the cloud being the glory. And, and the glory has products or the anointings of God. And there's so many different anointings that come as we wait on the Lord and his glory begins to manifest in us. Let me give you a couple of examples. God's anointing can be demonstrated in the area of ministry. It's called dunamis. So as we wait on the Lord, as his glory is manifest on us, manifested in us, the cloud of his glory comes upon us. He begins to rain on us, and one of, one of the outworkings of that rain is the anointing called dunamis power. You need this to transform society. This dunamis anointing is the anointing of miracle working power. It's miracle working power. Christ in me, the hope of glory. So the glory of God carries the essence, the nature of God. And in that, there are anointings or abilities that flow. And one of them is the dunamis power of God. How many people need dunamis power flowing through their lives? So as we wait on the Lord, there comes a greater uh, dimensions of the dunamis power, the miracle working power of Jesus. You experience that. The miracle working power. Healed of Parkinson's disease, but totally healed. That's the dunamis power of Jesus flowing through us. Another one is God's anointing can be manifested, the glory, through um, another anointing called the iscus anointing. That's the anointing manifested in giftings and abilities. 1 Peter 4.11 says, If anyone speaks, let them speak as the oracles of God. And if they minister, let them do it with the ability that God supplies. That word ability is the iscus anointing. I-S-C-H-U-S. And so here's another one. As we wait upon the Lord and his glory fills us, there's an anointing that comes that gives you supernatural ability. How did Mordecai go from... Go from the king's doorman to being second in charge over 127 provinces. 
How did he do that? Because he came under an anointing where God supernaturally increased and accelerated his giftings and abilities. And your giftings and your abilities are far greater than what you realize because you can tap into the realm of his glory and out of that, the anointing will flow through and you'll begin to see that you are gifted with ability to do far more than what you really should do in the natural. You are not mere men. You don't operate in the flesh. We operate in the realm of the spirit. So whether it's with music, whether it's with sums, whatever it might be, God can anoint you to give you a supernatural ability to make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And then the, the glory comes in another anointing is God's Anointing demonstrated in the area of governance and dominion, the kratos anointing, K-R-A-T-O-S. Acts 19, 20 says, the, Lord, the word of the Lord grew mightily. Kratos is that word mightily. This was when, uh, you may remember the story, there were seven sons of Skeva, and they tried to cast out a demon. The demon turned on them and beat them up because they tried to cast out the demon like Paul did. And after that occasion, we see them bringing all their magic books and they burn it at Ephesus. I think it was like 50,000 or 60,000 uh, uh, talents of silver worth of books that were burnt up. And it says, And the word of, of the Lord grew mightily. In other words, there was dominion authority that came. There was an anointing on Paul and, and the disciples when they preached the word. There was dominion and authority to break every power of the enemy, to set whole cities free. That's the dominion anointing. As we wait on the Lord, we feel like uh, through his word, we begin to discover that we are called to rule and reign. We don't just roll over. He's both the lion and the lamb. There's a place for being the lamb and there's a place for being the lion. We begin to stand up and take our authority. As we wait on the Lord, his glory begins to flow. And one of the anointings that flows, that reigns out of his glory, is mighty dominion over the enemy. Not running with our tail between our legs, not scared of the dark, not being intimidated by the lies that come against us from the enemy. He sows lies and all of a sudden the anointing of the Holy Spirit rises up, the dominion of God and it says, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's dominion that comes as we wait on the Lord. And the, these last days, the only way we will transform society is that God will raise up men and women filled with the anointing of God, filled with dominion power that are able to rule and reign on each one of these mountains. Sissy babies can't rule on top of the mountains. People that get put off by the slightest amount of discomfort or resistance or, or, or work of the enemy, they stand up and they say, you're going to have to come through me first. God's anointing also rains down on us, and I call it the sonship anointing. The Greek word is exousia, E-X-O-U-S-I-A. It's the anointing of sonship. Matthew 28, 18 says, All power or exousia is given to me in heaven and earth. Again, in uh, John 1, 12, it says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right, that word is exousia, to become the children of God. It's the anointing of sonship. He gave the right, the exousia, to be the sons of God. And the anointing comes upon us of sonship. We get a revelation that God loves us, that we are the favorite child of God, that we are no longer orphans, no longer strays. But I tell you what, that will be one of the greatest anointings to come upon the body of Christ, the anointing of sonship, where we know that we know that we are loved and never will he forsake us or leave us. When you know that in your heart, no matter what's going on, that God is with me, you can go through the deepest valley, the dark a storm and come out the other side for there is an anointing on me of sonship how else did Jesus go through the cross how else did he survive the garden how else did he go through the wilderness except that he knew that I am the beloved son of God God's anointing to transform called energio e-n-e-r-g-i-o Ephesians 1.19 talks about the power, the mighty working power, which he wrought, that word is energy, energia or energized in Christ. 
It's an anointing to transform the energies of God. That word energy literally means God working within, inside work. And this is another anointing that's going to flow through the body of Christ. As we wait on the Lord, there's going to be an energizing that comes within us, a supernatural power. No longer are you going to be weary and stressed and depressed and energizing into your business, into your relationships, into your workplace. You will be the light that shines because it will be a transforming anointing of the Holy Ghost. There's many more of these anointings, the anointing for finance called wealth and so forth. And it all comes out of when the glory of God begins to flow through us. The glory is the cloud. And now that cloud, he rains on us every anointing, every gifting we need. What's the best gift of the Spirit? The best gift of the Spirit is the one that you need at that moment. And they're all there to rain on us. Now in the glory, there's an acceleration of God's purposes. I love this. What is a hundredfold harvest? A hundredfold harvest is simply this. A hundred years in one. That's what a hundredfold harvest is. The only way to get a hundredfold harvest is for a hundred years of harvest to accelerate and come into one. Amos 9.11 says, In that day I will raise up David's fallen tent. Amos has seen a day where there will be unrestricted access. The David's tent is about this, unrestricted access To the glory of God. Amos has seen there's coming a day unrestricted access. This is the day that we live in. And he says, verse 12, and they will possess, that word possess literally means to dispossess by driving out previous tenants. They will possess or dispossess the remnant of Edom. Edom is another word for Esau. And the whole thing about Esau was there was a battle over inheritance. And Amos is saying, The glory of God's going to come and God's going to raise up a people that are going to dispossess a tenant that's been on the earth for so long that he's holding an inheritance that doesn't belong to them. Then he goes on to say in verse 13, and there's coming the days where the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes those who sow seed. He's saying when the glory of of the Lord is poured out, the way to get back the inheritance that the enemy has stolen from you, this, will be, this is how it will happen. God will supernaturally speed up time and accelerate the purposes of God where you get a hundredfold harvest in a year. That is the only way it's going to happen. There will be a speeding up of the processes. So what took you a year to get a promotion will take a week. For the church in Melbourne to occupy all of the mountains, if, if all things being equal, it will take probably two or three generations. We don't have that much time. I need to step into the glory realm and say, God, show me how to step into that and accelerate your purposes, bring eternity into time. Because in eternity, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He can bring in the future and bring it into the past or the present. It's all the same to him. He goes on to say, and I will restore. I will rebuild. See, the only way God can restore and rebuild is to accelerate the purposes of God. He, Jesus explained this or showed this when he said to Peter, what have you caught? And he says, Lord, you know, we've You know, we've toiled all night and we've caught nothing. We've worked. We've used our greatest skills. We've worked. And some of you, you have worked and worked and done this and done that. And at the end of the day, you look and you say, Lord, we've caught nothing. There's not a whole lot of progress. And he says, well, you know what? Go out here. Go out there. Just just out there. And he goes out on the word of the Lord. And there is a supernatural increase. There is a acceleration of the purposes of God. And he stepped into the glory zone where he got such a catch that it overflowed his boat, his friend's boat. There were more fish than there was water. So in the realm of God's glory, this is what he's teaching us. My God will supply all my needs according to his riches in the glory. In the natural, it's going to take me a long time to make all the money I need. In fact, I could probably have 10 lifetimes and not make it. So I've got to find a way 
to step into his glory realm. Because in the realm of the glory, it's not nebulous. There is God's ideas, strategies. He will show you things to come. He will speak to you. He'll empower you. He'll anoint you. He'll give you abilities and giftings. This all flows in the glory realm. You would be far more productive, and I would be far more productive laying on our bed, waiting on the Lord, letting his glory fill us. We need to gear ourselves in this time for seeking the face of God and allowing his glory to fill us. You will be far more productive Jesus said, occupy till I come. <clears throat> occupy those mountains. He's not asking you. He's saying, you need to find the way to get on top of those mountains. Because I'm sitting up here waiting for all my enemies to be made my footstool. And guess what? You are my feet. I'm the head. You are the body. How can the enemy be made my footstool unless my body assumes a place of dominion and authority? The realm of Transfiguration. Transfiguration is the temporary change of a physical body. How many people would like that? Into a spiritual form under the influence of the glory. Jesus was transfigured. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. And it wasn't just a one-off thing saying, look at me, I'm the son of God. I can do party tricks. This isn't for you. This is just for me. I want you to see how great I am. It wasn't about that, because if it was about that, he wouldn't have shown them. See, all of his life was a model for how you are to live. When he was transfigured, he was saying, this is what I do, you can do likewise. The truth is here, that rays of the glory of God will flow through believers to display to the nations of the world the reality of God. Let me prove it. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, Arise and shine. That word shine means give light. For your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen. The word risen is to shoot forth beams out of yourself. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But God's going to shoot forth beams over you. And his glory will be seen of you and the Gentiles will will come to your light. That word light literally means lightnings. And kings will come to the brightness of your rising. When Jesus was transfigured, the disciples saw what was inside them, inside Jesus, his physical, in a physical, tangible way. So transformation, sorry, transfiguration reveals what is contained inside me. And I'm saying to you today, there is coming a day when the glory of the Lord will cover the earth and fill his people in such a way that people will see Christ in you, the hope of glory. You shall shine. You say, well, prove that, Andrew. Well, what happened with Stephen when he was about to be stoned? The Bible says that his face shone like an angel. Moses, under a lesser covenant, they had to put a veil over his face because his face, it was a decreasing glory, an inferior glory, but still a glory. And it was so uh, bright that they couldn't bear to look at it. It decreased, but the Bible says that you are introduced into a glory that is increasing and increasing and increasing. So I'm saying, Lord, if that's available for me, let your lightnings flow through me. Let there be rays and shafts of the glory of the Lord. So as I walk down the road, people look at my countenance and say, what is inside you? Yeah. Yeah. Behold, deep darkness will cover the earth, but God's people will start shooting out rays of lightnings. What's that going to do with transforming a society? I think if we're going to reach a whole city and we take an excursion down the main street, Swanson Street, and we're all radiating lightning bolts, it might get on TV. It might begin to arrest the attention of people. Karen and I have walked down the street uh, and, and people, be, like we had one man begin to manifest as we walked down, picked up the presence of God and began to speak over me. He saw what was inside me. They begin to react to the presence of God. You don't know what's inside you. Well, maybe you do, but the glory of God is in you. And so you, we, we need to pray, God, Release your glory through me today. Let, zap people. Let the lightnings of God touch people that I could not reach 
I had no access to. You will walk past people that you're not connected to relationally and they will see the glory of the Lord. And it says, kings will come to the brightness of your rising. Do you know what kings are? Men and women of influence. Why? Because of the glory of the Lord that is upon you. That's why we wait on him. We're getting a recharge. Transfigurations are going to take place. It's going to transform our society. Another one is the realm of transportation. The movement of natural objects into the spirit dimension without changing its physical properties. Philip was caught up in the glory realm. Paul was caught up. Elijah would often disappear into realms of the spirit. That shall mount up with wings like eagles. As you wait upon the Lord, God's going to open up spiritual dimensions for you to fly in the spirit realm to walk in the spirit realm, to run like Elijah did. We dumb down almost every scripture to our known reality. But he's saying there's an invitation. Paul did this. In Colossians, he says, I'm absent in the flesh, but I'm with you in the spirit. He was keeping a check on some of the churches in the realm of the spirit. He says, I'm not there in the flesh, but I've joined with you in the spirit realm. And in the days to come, one of the ways that we're going to disciple nations is God's going to do this thing over and over again. He's going to transport people like he did to Philip with the eunuch, wasn't it? And all of a sudden he was called away and God's going to position us. What's all this about? It's about the acceleration of the purposes of God to do what we couldn't do. We've been relying on practical means to change a city and God's saying, I want to do far much more. So we say, God, transfigure me. Let your lightnings come through me. Let your anointings come through me. Let your lightnings come through my body. And then we say, Lord, transport me wherever you want me to go. Let there not be a limit by my time or my space, my location, but put me wherever you want me each day. Say, well, I've never seen that before. But Peter had never walked on water either. He had a lot of doubters. Ah, it won't happen. Stay in the boat. Don't be ridiculous. That was for the old covenants, not for the new. It doesn't happen anymore. Only in Asian countries, only in African countries where they're desperate and they need a miracle or they'll die. It doesn't happen in the Western world. Stay in the boat with us. Peter said, Lord, if that's you, if it's in the word, bid me to come. Even if I sink a few times, bid me to step out. The realm of transmutation. Well, that sounds a strange one. This is the permanent movement. This is the last one I'm going to do. Of all migration of spiritual subjects from the realm of the spirit into the realm of the natural. It's the permanent movement or migration of spiritual objects or subjects from the realm of the spirit into the realm of the natural. Manna came from heaven. I think it's Psalm 76, somewhere around there. It says that the manna was angel food or food of mighty men. And God took food from a spiritual reality and gave it to a, uh, translocated into a natural reality for people to feast on. Jesus, where did he get the, uh, the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes? Where did it come from? It came from a spiritual reality. It was in the spirit and it manifested in the realm of the flesh, in in our natural reality. There's many examples of this. This is a realm that breeds mighty signs and wonders. We've seen it here to a small degree so far. When gold dust appears, where does it come from? It wasn't here before, but we've seen it. Uh, materialize in front of our eyes. We've been in meetings where feathers have fallen or gems have fallen. Different things have come from a spiritual reality and comes into a physical reality. It's an invasion of the natural realm by the realm of the supernatural to fulfill God's plans and purposes. Do you know, if you look at the end of the end days, it says that there's going to become a new Jerusalem and it's going to come onto, the, onto earth. That's called mega transmutation. That's when heaven invades earth. 
But until that day comes, we're going to see deposits from heaven to earth. And I venture to say that it's going to come and bring wealth to God's people. There's a man, I'm trying to remember his name. He was an AOG pastor and he had encounters. He had an angel come and visit him. One of the things that would happen with him is that angels would come and give him food. And he ate of that food. And I can't remember the exact days, but over a period of about a month, he lost an incredible amount of weight. They gave him all sorts of things. They gave him scrolls and he could supernaturally then remember scripture. I think he had something like, and don't quote me on this, but something like a hundred prophetic things would happen in the future from heaven to earth. And I know for myself included, for many of us, we've had this level, but God's saying, I want to bring my world into your world. I want to accelerate my purposes so my glory will be seen. So people will honor me and praise me. They will see the reality of who I am. He's going to accelerate his purposes. He's going to transfigure you. He's going to transport you. He's going to bring things from heaven to you. He's going to resource you. How did Isaac sow in the land of famine and reap a hundredfold? Where did he get the water from? Read scripture and say, Lord, what were you doing? Seeds don't grow without water. Water doesn't come in famine. Where did the water come from? Christ was a rock that they tapped on and water gushed out of a rock. We know water doesn't live in a rock. There was a manifestation of heaven on earth. There was, there was what we call this transmutation. There was a spiritual reality. There is a river in heaven and it came to earth. So I'm saying to you, don't limit what God will do in this season. He's showing us signs that his glory is about to be revealed in a whole new dimension. There are fresh anointings, fresh aspects of his glory that we can tap into if you want it. So be encouraged today. Be encouraged. The greatest outpouring of his spirit is available to his people. But he has a plan to transform society with it. It's not just about us coming together and doing some party tricks. Is that he wants to bring, see, in his glory, all his power, all his wisdom, all his goodness is there. And he accelerates that to position us in places of influence and authority. Because he says, I will disciple the nations. He's going to do it through you. So I'd encourage you today, please, please, do not look at yourself and say, who me? What could God do? My life's a mess. I'm this, I'm that. His glory. The Bible says Christ in you. The expectation. So when you look into your future, there's an expectation of the glory of God increasing and increasing and increasing. And faith takes that expectation and says, I'll have it right now. So I want to tell you today, you are incredibly resourced. The glory of God is in you. Wait on the Lord. As you wait on the Lord, you shall renew your strength. You will rise up in a spirit realm. And it may not happen the first day, but you just keep waiting on the Lord and his glory will begin to be released in greater dimensions. And that's what I'm going for. I lay on my bed and I say, okay, God, increase it, increase it, increase it. Let the lightnings come through me. When I stand up here, let your lightnings come through my body and touch people. Transform them. So put your hands out right now, please. Father, I thank you that the glory that belongs to you, that is who you are, your power, your presence, who you are, your nature, it's here right now. It's living in every man, woman, and child that is a believer in Christ Jesus. You said it's in us. The tabernacle of your glory is in us. Same glory that Adam walked in, that Jesus walked in, it's in us right now. Your presence, your person. And I pray, Lord, teach us how to access your glory, how to release it through our life. Let, there be, let every cell, every 
every part of our body vibrate with the glory of your presence. For Father, you said that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord would fill the earth. Everyone, it, people, even those that don't know you, they'll say, That's, yeah, I know about it. That's the glory. I know why they're shining. So, Lord, we pray, increase the dimension that we live in of your glory and its effect on our world. In that place, reveal to us hidden secrets and mysteries, revelation, resources, everything that we need. Accelerate your purposes in our life. You promised, Lord, through the prophet Amos, that the plowman would overtake the reaper, that there'd be an acceleration like he did to Mordecai in one day, Lord. It looked like he'd been forgotten. He'd done so many good things and been overlooked, but in one day you accelerated the purposes and you took him from the doorman to second in charge of kingdoms. And I ask today, Lord, release your glory on your people. Why don't you just bask in his glory right now? Just say, All right, I receive your glory. Let it flow through me, through my body, through my mind. Release your glory.